Welcome, Dr. Karen Smith. It's wonderful to have you on board today. Karen completed a Bachelor of Animal and Veterinary Bioscience at the University of Sydney, and then went on to complete a PhD in 2022 under the supervision of Associate Professor Om Dongul. Most of you who have been on a Ship Connect New South Wales pres presentation before may have met Om. He has done a foot rock presentation or two for us in the past. The thesis she um, completed was titled Study of Lesser Virulent Foot Rot in New South Wales. And as, as doing that, she investigated various aspects of benign and intermediate foot rot, including the pathogenesis of isolates, the efficacy of biovalent vaccines, and conducted a survey of farmers to determine their opinion and experience of all forms of foot rot. After completing her PhD, Karen began working for the DPI at the Elizabeth MacArthur Institute in 2021 as a technical officer in the biological laboratory. As part of her duties there, she conducted virulence testing of isolates cultured from foot swabs, collected and submitted for diagnostic testing. So we're in safe hands today, that's for sure, having Karen here with us. And I've got your presentation up on screen now, Karen, and your webcam and see that your mic's on. So welcome, I'll let you take the reins. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, Fiona. Sorry, just getting the um, controls out of the way so we can see. So thank you, and my name's Karen Smith and I work for the Department of Primary Industries at EMAI, uh, which is the Elizabeth MacArthur Agricultural Institute at Menangal. So I'll just give an overview today about what is foot rot and various aspects of management and control and what options are available to producers and farmers uh, which can help manage and uh, hopefully eliminate disease if that's the aim. So foot rot's a bacterial disease that affects cloven hooved animals including sheep and goats. Cattle can also be affected but they're mainly uh, known to be carriers for disease and can and develop minor uh, lesions from it. So dicolobacter nidosis is our causative agent. Um, it can involve the colonisation of other bacteria species as well, but nidosis is our um, main cause. So it is a contagious disease which affects sheep globally. So there's not many countries in the world which have sheep who are not affected by foot rot. The main impacts are twofold. So we have an economic impact. So in this re results in reduced wool and meat production. So animals don't grow as well. And it can also have uh, reproduction losses as well. Another issue that can arise is animal welfare concerns. So it can cause severe lameness, it can lead to recumbency, and animals can be prone to fly strike. And the third aspect, which is often not talked about, is the disease from a farmer's perspective. So uh, in some areas in particular, there's a severe social stigma associated with the presence of disease. Um, so that's something we'd be looking at um, addressing and hopefully improving. That, that side of things. Okay, so a little bit about nidosis itself. So it's an anaerobic bacteria and it has a very characteristic uh, terminal swelling and there's a rod shape. So this is an electron micrograph photograph, um, which shows a, a very enlarged image, of course. Um, and, and in this, you can see the fimbriae or hair structures. And these assist in colonisation of the foot and, and resulting in infection. So there is a range of virulence uh, in these isolates. So when we say virulence, we refer to the ability of an organism to infect and cause disease. So and we know foot rot varies and there's a spectrum of disease rating from less severe to more virulent foot rot, which is quite severe. And so this is one of the factors that can influence this. There's also a range of serogroups. So there are 10 serogroups in Australia, Ada, I and M. Um, M at the moment has only been isolated in Tasmania. So the nine serogroups, Ada, I is uh, predominantly what we have in New South Wales. Immunity, which may develop in sheep, is serogroup specific. So you might have uh, isolates of a, a specific serogroup in your flock, and then if you introduce a new serogroup, uh, immunity may not be present for that new serogroup. And the virulence is not associated with serogroup, so you can have uh, benign isolates of a serogroup A, and you could have a virulent isolate of serogroup A. So foot rot transmission, uh, this is an important factor. So we have what's called a epidemiological triangle. So 
These three factors relate to potentially any disease, but with foot rot, the three parts of the triangle, so our host, our pathogen and environment, all contribute to foot rot disease, transmission and severity. So our host, so I'll discuss a little bit further, um, obviously our sheep, the individual immunity is important. Our pathogen, so we've got the virulence of our isolate and environment, so warm, moist conditions. And these will vary throughout the year as environmental conditions change, as isolates are eliminated or as our host immunity can be challenged and change as well. So what are the factors that contribute to this uh, host, as I mentioned? So there are differences in breed susceptibility. Merino are more susceptible to disease, and we know we have a lot of Merino sheep in Australia. Uh, British breeds uh, tend to have more resistance just due to the environment they've originated from. The age and class of an animal as well, so younger naive animals may also be more susceptible to disease. Environmental conditions are very important. So typically we in environmental conditions where we get more than 25 mils of rain per month that can uh, predispose animals to disease. And this of course will vary across the state depending on um, whether you have summer, winter rainfall, so forth. And most farmers will be aware of when you're, they're likely to receive rainfall in their area. Of course, in drought conditions, and flood conditions, this will vary and may change this scenario. An environmental temperature typically above 10 degrees is required for foot rot transmission. You may get cases where it's less, but typically that's the general rule that, that applied. And, and we do see more uh, transmission and disease in spring where we have warmer conditions and a little bit more moisture in the environment. The pasture type can also affect disease. So uh, such as clover, so um, plants that can retain moisture and predispose a feed again, may be more um, likely to have an effect on disease. The pathogen itself, so that's the denodosis. So the virulence of the isolate is important in the severity of disease that will develop. And there can be isolates with a range of virulence in the flock. So um, this is something we can test for and look at, but it just be aware that um, there can be a lot of little bit of variation there as well. And how some isolates uh, express disease and show disease uh, um, may vary again depending on the environmental and host um, that it's infecting. So we talked about environmental conditions. We are sort of uh, talking coming into a drought type scenario coming up this year. Um, but this is our LLS regions in the map on the left. And then this is the annual rainfall so far for New South Wales um, from Bureau of Meteorology. And you can see it's quite variable across the state and um, more so on the east and south areas have received more rainfall. And this might reflect of the areas that are where foot rot's more present. So Western region where it's quite dry, there's probably going to be less disease and less foot rot, as well as up being Northern Tablelands. So the severity of disease, it ranges in, and it is on a spectrum, but we need to, for regular tree purposes, we need to sort of draw a line in the sand at some point and classify benign foot rot and virulent foot rot. So this can require inspections of a flock and it may require multiple inspections, so depending on the stage of infection and whether how each mob is affected. In the early stages of infection, it can be difficult to differentiate whether it's benign foot rot or virulent foot rot. So an additional inspection can also help determine whether the disease has progressed from minor infection to becoming more severe. So in New South Wales, virulent foot rot in sheep and goats is a notifiable disease. So that's something to, um, we all need to be well aware of, which I'm sure most people are. So benign foot rot, which is the less severe form, um, it's typically associated with interdigital lesions, such as those shown uh, at the top image there in figure A. So they can be uh, still quite nasty, as you can see in that top image there, and still cause some amount of lameness but they don't, don't typically become the severe underrun. 
You might get some underrun lesions in the odd animal, but it's typically very limited. Virulent foot rot, however, is the severe, more severe end of the spectrum and more severe disease. It's likely to have a high number of animals in the flock affected, and um, which can be more than 1% of score four lesions. It will be um, possibly considered virulent. And you can see in image B here where the, the whole foot is affected and um, obviously quite severe lesions developing there. So how do we determine whether the foot rot's benign or virulent? So in New South Wales, diagnosis is based on the clinical disease. So we have at least 100 sheep will be randomly inspected and foot scored from each mob. It, as, as mentioned, it might require multiple inspections and it might require different mobs to be inspected as disease may be expressed differently in different classes of mobs of animals. And this diagnosis is supported by laboratory results. And it, that results are culturing of foot swabs, and then we do an elastase test on them. So when the animals are inspected at this point, it's important to check every foot, and then if required, conduct hoof pairing. So it can be difficult to tell um, what's lurking underneath, particularly in those overgrown hooves, like shown in the first image. Until you pair them back, you, you don't know if it's going to be a healthy foot or there's um, lesions hiding underneath it. So in feet that we trimmed back, we were able to find um, a fly with toe with fly blow in this middle image there, and then underrun lesions um, on the right hand side here. It's quite time consuming, but it's um, definitely an important step. So you may have seen this image before. This is a foot scoring system devised by the DPI and it runs through the uh, range and lesions you will see and how we apply a score to them. So first image is a score zero and that's allocated to a normal healthy foot. And you can see there's fur, fur wool between the toes. Score one and two are typically interdigital lesions and you may get um, a high number of these associated with benign foot rot. And then score three, you start to get underrunning is where the sole of the hoof becomes separated. And scores A, B and C, representative of the level of underrunning where it starts out less severe, and then C, it, it, it travels further across the foot. Score four is associated with underrunning that travels to the abaxial wall, so across the width of the foot, and score five, that the whole foot's affected. And score fours and fives are what we typically associate with virulent foot rot. So once the animals have been inspected, um, foot swabs can be taken and then sent to the laboratory. And then where they do a culture of it. So the first part of this is to identify whether the nidosis is present or not. And we do this by setting the foot swabs up on a hoof agar plate. And these are examples of colony morphology that we might see from the foot swabs. So those are indicated by red arrows. You do get other bacteria and mixed infections going, and this may reflect what's happening in the foot at the time. So you may have other abscesses. Um, it can be other hoof conditions like shelly toe present. So um, we purify these isolates, and then, which may require repeat testing, but eventually we get a pure ISA, which we can conduct our virulence testing on. So we do the virulence testing using the elastase test. And so this does assess the virulence of an isolate. So it's not to determine the, viril the severity of disease. That might be something different. So how, we do, how it does this is it digests or clears the elastin particles from around the inoculation streak. So on the left, we have a control isolate. We have the top one there, the bend, which is benign, and V is virulent. So you can see there's a zone of clearing around the virulent isolate. So that's mimicking the sort of the, the hoof being, hoof particles being destroyed, from them, causing the underarm lesions. And so these are diagnostic isolates we have on the right. So uh, F, you can see, is positive. And G and H we have at the start of a clearing and it um, may become positive at a later date. 
This test is conducted over 28 days and we report the results uh, the day they're positive and we give these results back to the submitter, uh, veterinarian testing, and they'll take these into consideration as to what they've witnessed in the field and the severity of the clinical disease to make their final diagnosis. There are occasions where the elastase test results do not align with what might be expected, and this could be due to a number of reasons, including sampling, the ability of isolates to grow, and other conditions such as the environment at the same time of disease or sampling, and also the animals tested. So whether they have a good level of immunity or they're quite naive, susceptible to disease. So when virulent foot rot is diagnosed, um, an individual biosecurity direction will be issued. And this specifies the actions required to eradicate disease. And following this, a foot rot eradication plan will be developed between the farm and the veterinarian. So there are a number of options available to farmers, and this is to make the plan flexible enough to suit their needs and be able to fit in with their production type, their, their farming schedules and so forth. So one of the options is removal of all sheep from the property. Um, again, that, that will depend on what suits a farmer. So options in relation to this may be animals go directly to slaughter, to slaughter sale only, or they may be sold to a feedlot, but uh, previous requirements are required um, to ensure the animals uh, can be managed in that facility. Other options may be inspections and culling animals and also an inspector and treat, which may be a, cast as a salvage mob. Um, that there may be a, a combination of these options adopted by the farmer, but again, it, it will depend um, what suits farmers. And veterinarians are, are more than happy to work with farmers closely to come to the best arrangement possible. Benign foot rot. Um, we're possibly seeing more of this and, and the less severe, so possibly the intermediate type uh, severity foot rot around and less of the traditional virulent foot rot that, that's known. Um, it's sometimes called non-progressive foot rot or scald. And characteristic of this disease is it can regress in hot, dry conditions. So you might have lesions come up in spring, but when summer comes and it's hot and dry, they might see this self-resolve. And when this happens, isolates will often reside in a pocket of the hoof and then wait until conditions to return to be more favorable. And then um, you'll have expression and disease come back. They're notoriously difficult to eradicate these isolates. So partly due to the time and cost involved. And then there's the argument of, is, is it beneficial to spend all that time versus the amount of losses they could cause? Some of the benign isolates, particularly in environmental conditions, can still cause a quite a severe amount of lameness and production losses. And again, it'll be up to individual producers um, how they see to manage this, but it's always good to seek veterinary advice from other resources that I'll discuss later on. So these two images shown, these are interdigital lesions, So, but you can see that again, they're quite um, quite inflamed and painful, and then we're definitely causing a amount of discomfort to the affected animals. So when you do have foot rot, what are uh, the treatment and management options? So eradication and treatment control, whichever one you're applying, uh, it's ideally aimed at the flock or even regional level. So treating an individual animal is probably a less ideal way to go about it because so it is contagious, it's likely to affect more than one animal. So foot pairing, so this is obviously done if you have overgrown or misshapen feet. Uh, care does need to be taken not to damage the hoof. We know if you cause a hoof to bleed, it can cause misshapen and cause even more lameness. So um, care does need to be taken in that. And it is quite labor intensive and time consuming. It's often done in, during inspections, particularly in the initial phase where we're, a diagnosis is being made and allows the foot to be paired back and the extent of the lesions to be determined. Foot bathing is a common treatment and management tool used. So often zinc sulfate, which can be used with or without a surfactant, and as other commercial products such as Radicate. Uh, formalins was previously used, but it's really not 
recommended or, or to be used at this um, due to welfare, obviously it's not, and toxicity involved in it. So zinc sulfate eradicate. Uh, it's also always good to um, seek, seek advice from veterinarians in relation to this as well. So options for using this, you can use a stand-in foot bath or you can use the troughs with a walking through. Uh, you can walk them through repeated times to get uh, more exposure to the treatment if required. And a way to improve the efficacy of the foot bathing is to try and keep the feet dry after treatment. Um, we know this can be challenging in some, some setups and some environments, if there's, but if there's a way to do this, um, if you can keep them dry for 24 hours or so, that would be ideal. Antibiotics are often also used, um, and these are under the advice of a veterinarian and a prescription only treatment. So following the veterinarian's advice on the type and usage is very important, as there is a, a growing concern regarding antibacterial resistance and over usage. So um, we do need to be careful for this. Uh, multiple treatments may be required in use, but we're sort of saying if, if they're really not responding at all, um, there'd be a candidate to be culled from the mob. So another option available um, is vaccination. And this at the moment can only be used in an approved foot rot eradication program but it still requires uh, Chief Veterinary Officer approval to be used. So this, if you have interest in this, um, please discuss it with the vet veterinarians involved. So the foot rod available at the moment in New South Wales is the Cooper's Avilis foot vax vaccine. And it's a multivalent vaccine. So it has serotypes A to I, including the two, uh, two variants of serogroup B, which have slightly different genetic sequences. Um, and protections from 10 to 12 weeks, but some could possibly last up to the 16 weeks again. So as mentioned, this, this is a multivalent vaccine, so it includes the different ser serogroups uh, in, one, in the one vaccine. One of the downsides of this is you can get antigenic competition. So, this often results in a reduced length of protection um, compared to a mono or bivalent vaccine, and the immune response may be a little lower than what you might get with a mono or bivalent vaccine. A couple of the benefits of using this vaccine, though, is it doesn't require testing beforehand to identify the number of serogroups present. Uh, so it may be more efficient to use this vaccine if you have multiple serogroups present. So if you have four five or six serogroups present, this might be an efficient way to address them. And again, if animals don't respond to treatment, you'd be looking at removing them from the flock. The other vaccine that's been developed and trialled is the, the farm-specific mono myovalent vaccine, which you may be aware of. It's um, largely developed at the University of Sydney. It's currently not a registered for use in Australia with the Australian Pesticides and Veterinary Medicines Authority. So it's not able to be used um, at this moment. But in trial has been used previously to eradicate virulent foot rot uh, in Nepal and Bhutan. And in trials conducted in Australia, flocks uh, affected by virulent foot rot, they did get um, very good results in, in disease management. Again, the removal of non-responding animals is important. So this is, and this is true for any treatment, so you're going to have individual variation. So this just needs to be managed um, as part of the program going forward. Much of the work on foot rot vaccine revolves around virulent foot rot. However, I did conduct a trial using the bivalent vaccine in flocks with benign foot rot in four farms. We did find the blood antibody T levels were consistent with the minimal level required for protection. And so it may, these lesser virulent or benign foot rot isolates may actually be able to be eliminated using the bivalent vaccine. So I haven't tested the, or examined the foot vax, but it may be a similar result. And so this might be advantageous if you do have a range, isolates with a range of virulence in the flock as well. So whilst it's, it's ideally, uh, Avoiding disease in the first place is the ideal way to go. We know um, it's not always possible. Um, so how can we 
reduce the impact of it and also prevent it um, if, if we can. So surveillance is um, a big key and management is a big part of it. So regulatory, regular monitoring and inspection of mobs is critical. Um, if you see any lame animals, have a look and see what the, what the cause is. Um, I know they, we have very large flocks in Australia, so therefore it can be on very large farms. So it can be difficult to pick out one individual animal, but if, if you can inspect and pick up as quickly as possible, it can either result in, if it is present, um, being easily, more easily able to contain the disease, or if it's limited to one mob, it might be easier to elim eliminate and eradicate that disease as well. It's often a regional issue. So in New South Wales, um, down south, the Murray Riverina, Central Table and Central West, so, so probably have a higher prevalence of disease. But speaking to neighbours, um, what's LLS staff in particular, just find out what's going on in your area. Um, it, may, it may find if there are more outbreaks, you may need to be a little bit more vigilant than what you may have been in the past. So it's always a good source of information. Uh, if you're buying in sheep, it's important to have um, good health checks before you purchase the sheep. So getting a vendor declaration and inspecting all of the feet prior to purchase. So whether that's done through an agent or veterinarian or yourself, um, that's, that may be uh, up, up for you to decide, um, but it's a good idea to get it done. Moving sheep into a different environment can dis result in disease expression. So if you're purchasing sheep from an area where it may be a little bit drier, um, a little bit, conditions a little bit less conducive for disease, they might have minor lesions. And if you're importing a sheep and you're moving them into an area that is conducive for disease, or there are sheep on your farm that are susceptible to disease um, and it spreads to them, it can become um, a quite severe problem. So preventing in the first place is always ideal. Secure fencing and adequate fencing. So this is important. Uh, the prevention of stray animals, um, you know, fences become damaged for various reasons, but keeping a good eye on perimeter fences and internal fences even is important. Um, and also keeping eyes on if you're using a creek or a river as a boundary, if that dries up and obviously you're, you're losing your boundary there. So that's always um, an option for stray animals to wander across there. Checking rams, so that rams are might be the animals that are purchased, so um, often from a, the same source. So that's important to check them because they will also be the animals that are spread around to other mobs and if there is disease, they may transmit it to other mobs. And quarantining new stock, so it's, it, it is an important step. So if you can keep them uh, isolated from other sheep, or goats and animals you have on the farm for ideally two weeks. Um, so within this time, if there is a risk of any d disease developing, it's likely to be expressed and come to light within these two weeks. And it's always a good idea to inspect the feet of them prior to release as well. So rather than just sort of going, yes, it's been two weeks, they're okay. Um, actually have a really good look at them. I said, so lesions that might not look too bad in them. Uh, might become quite severe in other animals. And establishing on-farm biosecurity procedures, so vehicles and workers might be shared between farms um, that, that could be potentially infected. Um, and whilst the bacteria typically doesn't reside in the soil for a long time, roughly around two weeks, it may be transmitted in hoof particles and, um, and then spread disease, so that's important as well. So in conclusion, we know foot rot is a very challenging disease to manage and eradicate. Um, so it, it does require a lot of cooperation between farm and veterinarian, biosecurity officers, uh, diagnostic labs, um, foot rot contractors to get on top of it and come up with a plan and execute that plan. And then of course, we know that um, environmental conditions play a role as well. So advice would be if you, have any concerns or any foot rot is suspected at all, please notify and seek advice from LLS veterinarians, biosecurity officers. Um, they're there to help and inspect, um, come out 
have a look, see what's going on. And environmental conditions influence disease as, as we were discussed. So this might influence your management plans as well. So um, be aware of what's happening in your area and this can help as well control the issue if present or even prevent it. So management will suit between farms. Um, choose the best options that suit your enterprise. Um, so if you have very high value animals, obviously um, keeping a very close eye on inspections of them um, is critical as well. Maintaining your fencing and, and keeping their feet in good condition. Uh, letting the feet dry out if it's wet, if possible. But again, that will depend on um, between farms. So there are uh, excellent resources available. So uh, the Sheep Connect foot rock booklet, as Fiona referred to earlier, and there's an excellent uh, prime fact that's been produced by the DPI, as well as the DPI website that has a lot of information. Uh, the University of Sydney also has a website that's available with information uh, and, and a range of topics of foot rot, so you can um, have a look on that. And it's, it could be uh, useful information for you as well. So I think that sums it up for me. Thank you, Fiona. So thank you everyone, particularly AWI and Sheep Connect for the opportunity to talk today. Um, the DPI, particularly added EMAI, and um, Joan Howard for the assistance in reviewing in the presentation today. Um, so that's my email if anyone has any questions or other topics um, outside of today.